Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for, for coming out. Uh, my name is Marianne bourchek Laporte. Uh, I'm the uh, curator of this uh, lecture series, uh, of which is the second installment tonight. I have the pleasure of, um, of introducing, in just a few moments, uh, Jamie Peck uh, as our speaker. Uh, but first, uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with this project, as you uh, may have come to the first, uh, the first lecture of the lecture series, uh, but I'll just give a, a brief rundown of this. So it's a project I've been developing through a curatorial residency at uh, Unit Pit Projects, um, and the lecture series is co-presented by Unit Pit, uh, the SFU Van City Office of Community Engagement, and the uh, SFU Institute for the Humanities. So we're very lucky to have these three partners for the presentation. Um, so Spaces of Contestation, Art, Activism in the City um, is a lecture series that will foster critical discussion around issues of urbanism, community activism, and politically engaged artistic practice. Taking as a starting point the particular urban and socioeconomic context of the city of Vancouver, the series engages notions of spatial politics, resistance, and aesthetic engagement. Speakers working in the field of urban and economic geography, activism, creative writing, visual arts, and art history will be invited to engage with the topic from their particular area of expertise. So tonight is the second talk, and we have talks um, in the new year in February, March, and April. And so this series is part of a uh, multi-layered project that researches the aesthetic and conceptual overlap existing between strategies for participatory performance and activist self-organized demonstrations. Um, it is presented as part of Unit Pitt's 2013-14 uh, uh, programming year. Um, and so in uh, March and April, we'll have a series of performances realized in collaboration between four local artists and local community organizations and an in-gallery exhibition. Um, our next talk is, uh, of this lecture series is in February. It is uh, Urban Subjects uh, that we'll be talking. They're a local, uh, well, Vancouver and Vienna-based artist collective. Um, and the talk will be on February 12th. Um, at 7 p.m. in this building. Um, so, um, oh, and I should also recognize that um, the BC Arts Council uh, is funding this project through the Arts-Based Community Development Program. And before I forget, I also want to recognize that we are on unceded Coast Salish territory. Um, I was also asked to present um, tomorrow's uh, Van City Office of Community Engagement um, program. Um, we have, uh, they have Leanne, Leanne Simpson uh, coming to speak. The talk is called Restoring Nationhood, um, Addressing Land Dispossession in the Canadian Reconciliation Discourse. Uh, so that's at 6 p.m. in the uh, cinema here on the third floor uh, tomorrow night. So without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker tonight, Jamie Peck. Um, he is the Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy and Professor of Geography at UBC. An economic, ge an economic geographer with interests in labor studies, urban theory, and the politics of globalization, his publications include Constructions of Neoliberal Reason and the co-edited collection Cont Contesting Neoliberalism, Urban Frontiers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Marianne, and uh, thank you also for the invitation to uh, be part of this uh, series. It's a, a great honour and um, nice for me to uh, get the chance to be uh, out around town in the after dark, which I don't usually do, so this is good. Um, uh, what I want to do today is to um, uh, provide some context, I think, for the subsequent uh, uh, discussions. Um, some of it a little theoretical, um, quite a bit of it rather polemical and cheeky, um, which is really an exploration of um, the nature of the neoliberal city and the place of arts and culture um, in that transformed and transforming environment. Um, what I will be doing today is essentially a talk of two parts um, and Hopefully you can see the connections. I'll try to make some uh, myself, but there are essentially two sides of this. Firstly, I'll say something about um, cultures of neoliberalism and uh, what this 
um, pervasive N-word, uh, a sort of critic's term for the market moment in which we live, uh, what that means for the study of cities, what it means for urban politics, and, and if you like, the kind of macro framing of, uh, of urban politics. And then say something about the different kinds of urban transitions which we're seeing um, around the world in a context of a neoliberal urbanism. Um, in that context, I'll say a little bit about uh, Vancouver, but I'm conscious that I probably know less about that than most people here, as I'm a relatively recent um, arrival in this city. I've only been here a few years. Uh, but since I've been here, I've been trying to puzzle out what it is that makes Vancouver tick, and, uh, and perhaps we can get into a conversation about that as we move along. Um, so the comments on Vancouver are going to be more speculative and perhaps a little uh, provocative. Oh, there's not supposed to be two of those, but uh, there are. Um, the second part uh, of what I talk about will be um, neoliberalizing cultures. And, uh, and here I want to talk specifically about the rise of the creative cities paradigm of uh, Richard Florida, um, somebody who I've been sort of stalking now for several years and uh, writing a fairly persistent and pitiless critique of. Uh, I'll be offering you uh, some glimpses of that. Uh, that. This is the more cheeky part of the, uh, of the talk. Um, and... and I, I really, I won't apologize for uh, its uh, tone or the strategy I adopt, which will include uh, sarcasm, ridicule, and, and maneuvers like this, because I think uh, Florida's work we have to ex uh, explore as a cultural phenomenon rather than as a, a theory of urban change. Uh, and I think that opens up a wider repertoire for interesting forms of critique, um, uh, which I know others have also taken up. So I'll be uh, ranging a little uh, into that in, in that part of the talk. And then I'll end by uh, trying to answer the question about why uh, an apparent cult of urban creativity has taken hold uh, in many cities around the world, which is a particular kind of mobilization of culture and the arts in the service, literally in the service, of orthodox um, economic development. Uh, so I'll be offering, offering a critique of that, uh, uh, that movement. So part one then is um, cultures of neoliberalism and I, this is essentially a bit of a, uh, a primer and uh, uh, somewhat abstract but uh, hopefully will give you a sense of what uh, I'm talking about when I use this word uh, neoliberalism. This will be the only commercial, uh, I promise, uh, in the talk. Um, but what is neoliberalism? Um, I think we can say many things about this. I've devoted much of my career to trying to answer the question. Uh, but in a nutshell, I would say uh, that this is an ideological project of market rule, uh, which, is, which developed itself initially as a critique of and alternative to the welfare state models of the post-Second World War period. Uh, the project of neoliberalism uh, is about a century old. It started off as an intellectual project pursued by people like Hayek um, and a number of European intellectuals. Increasingly, it became a transatlantic one as the Chicago School got involved after the Second World War. And it eventually became a series of state projects, really starting in the 1970s with Chile, later with New Zealand, the US, and, and Britain under Reagan and Thatcher, and so on. But this is a, it's a long-range ideological project, which really puts a, a, a broad frame around a series of policies with which we've become um, rather depressingly uh, familiar. Um, what it spawns is a paradigm or program of restructuring. I want to suggest that what neoliberalism is, in fact, is this rolling program of change associated uh, with these um, uh, defining features, uh, all somewhat inconsistently applied and realized, but typically present. Forms of privatization, arguments for deregulation and the removal of uh, state and bureaucratic uh, management, the development of policies that favor uh, corporations, uh, often monopolies, so these aren't necessarily straightforwardly uh, market-based policies. Uh, a, a general orientation towards uh, restrained taxation and a drift towards more and more inequitable uh, forms of taxation. 
and an embrace of selectively small uh, government, uh, particularly the shrinking of the social state, although the other parts of the state, including uh, the military and policing apparatus, may actually be growing. So the total size of the state may not shrink under this program, uh, but it, the state will progressively embrace different kinds of functions uh, pursued through these, this repertoire, if you like, of restructuring strategies. So when we talk about neoliberalism then, um, I would prefer it not to be a reference to a singular order or a uniform era. You often see references to this, that we live in the age of neoliberalism. I think that's something of a, a misrepresentation. What this really is is a rolling program of market-based transformation uh, which really doesn't know where to stop. There is no destination point necessarily for this program. If you look at the policies of the Tea Party in the United States, for example, that's a pretty good idea, uh, a pretty good example of a political project that has no idea where to stop, um, that essentially will constantly go too far, will constantly demand more and more, and in, in the end starts to look like a form of nihilism. Uh, and so ultimately this is what is at the end of many processes of neoliberal transformation. It's not taking us to a different endpoint. It's rather a constant revolutionary change in the direction of a more market-oriented uh, society. But what neoliberalism does in the here and now, I would argue, is define an, an acceptable, politically acceptable solution space for policy. It provides a kind of a frame uh, within which conventional solutions are sought and beyond which uh, certain solutions are regarded as beyond the pale or in politically infeasible. Um, and so this, it seems to me, is how neoliberalism actually works as this kind of moving frame of uh, policy uh, options that determines what is or is not feasible and practical in the short to medium term. A good illustration of this is responses to the uh, Wall Street crash of 2008, which were found within an extremely narrow uh, repertoire of possible responses. So this is how neoliberalism works in the here and now, if you will. So if that's neoliberalism, what is neoliberal urbanism? How does this work at the scale of the city? And here I want to just call attention uh, to a number of features of this, uh, of, of urban change under, under neoliberalism, which is of, of quite an important role, I think, in the overall uh, project. First of all, at the urban scale, we would expect to see the pursuit of um, economic growth and investment as a um, fundamental goal of urban governance and, and political management. We would witness the increased financialization of the city, um, a rise, uh, the increased reliance on speculative and debt financed uh, development becoming more uh, typical. Um, we would see the use of various forms of urban spectacle, uh, which as David Harvey and others have explained, uh, act as ways of accelerating uh, the movement of investment through the urban system and providing uh, moments, of, uh, moments in the sun for cities that pursue uh, the Olympic Games and other such uh, spectacular developments. And a whole series of building of signature um, events and, uh, and, and uh, signature buildings themselves, event architecture and, and star architecture and so on, is all part of this attempt to um, establish a place for the city in a, a world of mobile uh, investment and economic opportunity. Uh, furthermore, we would expect to see in the general terrain of neoliberal urbanism a reliance on more entrepreneurial forms of governance. These tend to be less democratic, um, more task force and project driven uh, kinds of initiatives drawing on elite net networks often clustered around a mayor and key members of the business community, a sort of um, shorthand forms of politics uh, which actually uh, tend to cut out uh, many residents of the city in the process. Um, Next, uh, urban privatism, um, uh, the privatization of services, uh, the adoption of business models and so on in, the, in, the, in urban management, uh, a shift towards market-based forms of distribution, 
uh, a range of policies that favor corporations and elites, uh, that tax restraint I mentioned earlier as a, a continuing feature of, uh, of urban life, which restricts the capacity for investment and uh, redistribution, of course. A whole series of rollbacks of inherited uh, uh, state structures and social services, um, especially uh, bureaucracies, uh, parts of the public sector, uh, socially oriented institutions tend to fall under attack in, in, under the neoliberal city. And the hardest and perhaps nastiest face of neoliberal urbanism uh, is the rise of what Neil Smith uh, called urban revanchism, uh, the vengeful face of the city, uh, the increasingly penal regulation of the poor and various marginalized uh, populations. So if that's a, you know, how would I recognize it when I see it uh, kind of indication, uh, let me now say something about uh, the kinds of transitions that we've seen um, under the sway of neoliberal ideology. Uh, my point here is I'm not going to get into these stories in any detail, uh, but rather just indicate that, for example, if we think of New York's transformation, its, its history prior to the 1970s was one of um, a rel a, a, really a bastion of liberal-style interventionism in the United States, a rather underdeveloped welfare state in that country, of course, but New York probably had the most built-out capacity for social policies and so on, relatively strong public sector unions. Um, the moment of truth for that uh, pattern of development was really the bankruptcy of New York in uh, 1975, um, after which we've seen the gradual construction of a particularly New York style of neoliberalism, broken windows policing, aggressive street-based uh, policing strategies, uh, workfare experiments in, in welfare reform, um, tax cuts for the rich, and so on, and a the phenomena of the disappearing middle in which um, uh, the Manufacturing, uh, working class and middle class are increasingly displaced from the city and it becomes uh, a highly unequal place with what's often called Manhattanization, describing a, an extreme uh, form of social inequality. And a series of generally conservative and business-oriented mayors have, have followed in the wake of this uh, strategy and enacted it. Um, of course, we may now be seeing some sort of course correction there with de Blasio's uh, recent election, but uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, Manchester in the north of England provides a different kind of story. Um, this is very much a public sector city of the British style. Its own, it met its own kind of um, moment of truth at the limits of its project of municipal socialism in the 1980s in explicit confrontation uh, with Thatcher in London. Uh, the Manchester strategy really depended on uh, fiscal resources from uh, the centre and from London and uh, it was increasingly choked off by uh, the Thatcherites uh, in London. And so Manchester's pattern of uh, embracing uh, uh, neoliberalism was really through its, the British Labour Party and its turn towards Blairite forms of social amelioration. Um, and it did this through a couple of uh, failed Olympic bids um, and uh, the embrace of regeneration policies and so on, uh, which actually relocated the middle classes um, out of the city and into the urban fringe increasingly and now being managed under the politics of austerity. My point of giving you these two quick pen portraits is to say that neoliberalism doesn't take the same form in any two places, neither are its transformations singular. There are, in a sense, there's a story we can tell about every city. New York is a sort of world city style, uh, global city style, style experience of neoliberalism. Manchester's is more of a post-industrial style. Um, but there is not a singular transformation. There's not a single yardstick against, we should, against which we should hold all experiences. So how, how would we make sense of Vancouver then, given that there's no uh, standard template? Uh, this is a city that's made its own kind of neoliberal journey, I would suggest, uh, but from a different starting point and with a different uh, current configuration. Uh, Vancouver's journey, as all of you know, will really set, started off from a point as, as a resource economy coordination hub and, and service center, and uh, that's really transformed itself 
into what is, I would summarize now, as a kind of real estate uh, growth machine as the, the, the heart of the Vancouver, Vancouver's political uh, economy. Um, in this context, we see the rise of livability discourses and their marketization as assets. Um, the development of the condo as a unit of speculation uh, in an increasingly uh, international market for investment. Uh, the dramatic uh, decoupling of housing and labor markets in the city such that Vancouver, I usually describe this as Vancouver's got a Cleveland-style labor market and a New York-style housing market. Uh, uh, there is a complete, increasingly complete disconnect between the capacities to earn in this city and the cost of living here. Um, and that is a particular Vancouver configuration. I think it's not a standard experience of even global cities. So the affordability crisis uh, follows from that. Vancouver's version of the dis disappearing middle is not the exit of thousands of manufacturing workers who were never really present in such large numbers in this city. I would say Vancouver's disappearing middle is more of a generational uh, disappearing middle. Uh, it's, uh, Vancouver, I would argue, lives and feeds off its young. Um, uh, it, there's a, it's the people who can't move through their 30s and 40s in this city due to the cost of living. That is the pinch point in the social structure of Vancouver. So we have a wealthy um, and older elite, a lot of young people who are not able to make a, a life in the city, very frankly. So the, the, Van, the inequality Vancouver style, if you like, has got a different social and generational shape uh, to that we might find in other cities. The economy that we are increasingly experiencing here is one based on a sort of experiential come resort style economy, uh, probably something more akin to Monte Carlo than many uh, North American cities. Uh, Vancouver's story has very much about been about the mobilization of urban spectacle, of course, from um, Expo. Uh, 86 uh, through the Olympics. Um, these, especially Expo, was the start of the kickstart for the False Creek uh, regeneration. Um, really, the beginning of the Vancouver model of urban development, and so on. And in many ways, Vancouver's uh, use of urban spectacle has been one of the most significant parts of its embrace of neoliberal urbanism. And in many ways, the skyline acts as a permanent urban spectacle and a backdrop to the inflated house prices. Uh, that we find in this city. Uh, some developers will say that those mountains give them about a 20% premium on, on prices in this city. Uh, so there's a kind of permanent form of inflation built in according, uh, thanks to the uh, Vancouver's location. There's also a particular style of urban discourse and policy in Vancouver, which I'll characterize here as narcissistic. Uh, Vancouver is extraordinarily impressed with itself. Uh, and, uh, and amongst other things, has produced its own model of urbanism, which it modestly calls Vancouverism, uh, which it promotes as an urban development paradigm that other cities uh, should follow. Um, and so there's a kind of self-indulgence uh, to much of the urban policy discourse discussion in this city that strikes me as a relative newcomer as something that is a little bit unusual. Uh, and if we look at this, the structure of government and so on in this city, there's much that could be said about this. I could talk for hours on it, but um, at least my impression here is we have um, a pretty much a small government uh, system, uh, a system of politics heavily focused on certain kind of symbolic issues like bike path hysteria and, and so on that fills all of the space uh, when there are many other things that we need to be talking about. And so we have a, a system of uh, city and provincial government with relatively little developmental capacity, relatively little redistributive capacity, uh, very weak metropolitan coordination, and largely AWOL um, province and federal interests in the city. So this is, again, it's a particular configuration of, of the state in Vancouver um, that, may, that means that many things like, for example, the affordability crisis are effectively out of the reach of state capacities, no, ma no matter what our mayor uh, would like to do about it. 
just to give you a little illustration um, to see where Vancouver sits in terms of per capita income, we are at the modest tail end of uh, incomes in North American cities, uh, just behind Phoenix, uh, quite a long way behind Detroit, although I suspect Detroit is moving in our direction rather than us moving in its. Uh, this is the very modest uh, labor market that um, underpins uh, the Vancouver economy today, uh, somewhat out of kilter with the fact that many people seem to be living in million dollar houses, they do not have high incomes relative to other cities. And neither are income growth rates particularly high. So this is again a city with a relatively modest labor market that doesn't generate that many high paying jobs, which doesn't have many high paying sectors, uh, but has this sort of resort economy uh, that in some way uh, kind of fills the space of the resource economy that left uh, a generation ago. Now one thing I want to do before I move on to talk about um, culture and Richard Florida is just give you a glimpse of what um, one or two of the movers and shakers in the city said to me as I did some interviews with them to try to figure out what does make Vancouver tick. Um, so these are their words, not mine, but I think in many ways go to uh, some, give you some sort of sense of how uh, at least those in positions of power candidly regard the way this city runs. This is a planning consultant saying that Vancouver if you just uh, look at it from a purely economic point of view, sits in the corner, in the dark, in the middle of nowhere. We're not a government place. We're not a manufacturing place. We're not any of those places. What we have is our wits and our good looks. Uh, that's what we have, and that's what our economy, except for marijuana, has got to be built upon. As a senior figure from one of the business associations in the city said, Vancouver is an interesting city with no visible means of support. Uh, if you actually go out looking for the economy, uh, it's quite a hunt, I can tell you. Um, and uh, what's filled the space of the economy is this um, recirculated income of relatively wealthy uh, uh, residents of the city. What drives Vancouver according to an urban development consultant, is that people make wealth in unpleasant places and they come here to spend their wealth in a pleasant place. That is it. <laughs> or, if you prefer, it's permanent tourists, that's our economy. People are choosing to live here just like you choose to go to resort or whatever. Now, the most optimistic way in which we could read this configuration uh, is this one. This is a senior planner uh, saying that this might be the basis for what he calls a Jane Jacobs uh, economy. Um, sorry, there's a word missing at the bottom of this quote. To me, the model of the economy is that wealthy people come here. Usually, they're in the ideas industry where people can do their jobs anywhere in the world. Then around them, a whole bunch of people cluster to give them services. And around that group, a whole bunch of people cluster, which isn't quite as glamorous, but it's the day-to-day -day urban services. And all of a sudden, you've got a Jane Jacobs economy. Jane Jacobs, who famously wrote about street life in Greenwich Village and so forth. According to a local architect, the part of the bet that we've won in Vancouver is the intellectual and human capital side. There are so many intelligent and interesting people here, but they all have a real hard time surviving here and dealing with housing costs. So there's the possibility then that this mobile creative class, the people working in the ideas industry, um, might be uh, Vancouver's uh, economic savior. So this is where I get on to uh, the second part of what I want to talk about tonight, which is uh, the neoliberalization of culture itself and the rise of um, Richard Florida as the uh, person who personifies and in fact lives a theory of urban development, which has become increasingly um, and almost painfully um, uh, omnipresent. So Richard Florida, if you don't know, is a professor of, um, in the uh, uh, business school at the University of Toronto. Um, and his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, unlike most books written uh, in my field, was a bestseller that sold in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and this book is 
uh, part a treatise on urban economics. It's part also a lifestyle manual for uh, the self-designated uh, creative class of which uh, Richard himself is a prominent uh, member. Um, it takes the form, much of it, as a, of a celebration of a kind of hipster uh, uh, urbanism, uh, a hipster urbanism where the central characters are portrayed as individualistic uh, people with very few uh, responsibilities other than nurturing their own talent. Uh, it's a rather hedonistic account of urban bohemians uh, saving the city and adorned with many references to the arts and to culture. And Florida himself, as a very effective salesperson of this theory, practically personifies it. Um, he himself ca carries himself almost in a, with a sort of rock star uh, comportment. The book is also partly an urban policy guide, which is one of the many reasons why it attracted so, so much attention. It tells, gives mayors some ideas about what they can do in this rather straightened environment that I've just outlined, where the opportunities for meaningful intervention at the urban scale are often quite limited, yet the responsibility carried by urban leaders remains quite significant. So Florida's book spoke directly to the urban leader in the 21st century. His argument is that we are living in a creative age where human creativity, or what he likes to call talent, is the source of all value in the economy and the driver of competitiveness. Creativity in Florida's account is carried in the heads and hearts of creative individuals who he anoints as the creative class. Therefore, harnessing creativity becomes uh, the new imperative, but in a context in which the creative class is a uniquely mobile group of cosmopolitans who move around from place to place in search of the most stimulating environment. So they are, they're often described as the young and restless, uh, young urban professionals uh, living a life to the max and, uh, and really illustrating this creative class theory of Florida's. This group, he claims, uh, based on some fairly shaky observational pop sociology, if you ask me, but anyway, he claims this, uh, that the group is not moved, uh, motivated simply by money, but, stay, uh, uh, but craves a stimulating environment. And so the creative class, as the carrier of all good things and the, um, the harbingers of high-quality economic growth and so on, become a new public policy priority, especially for city leaders. And the creative class in this context must be catered to. Uh, they must be given the right environment. Uh, the city must be made appealing to the creative class, or they will leave and take economic development with them. If I just give you a sense of his uh, form of analysis here, um, uh, the creative class itself is reckoned to account for about a third of 30 percent of the population in the States and, and in Canada. Uh, but that elite group is made up of two parts. Firstly, there is what Florida calls the super creative core, which essentially people working in computing, IT, engineering, the arts, design, entertainment, and so on, that make up 12% of the total population. Then you have a group of creative professionals in management, finance, legal, healthcare, high-end sales, and so on, who make up the balance. More or less, the creative class is everybody with a degree. Um, that's pretty much how it works out. Then, the afterthoughts in Florida's analysis are the working class and the service class, um, which have no positive role to play at all in the society that he envisages and no active role in the book. Um, all the action is with the creative class, the inheritors of the 21st century. It's their age and everything he has to say that's dynamic and positive adheres to that group. Nothing adheres to these other two groups except the notion that they perhaps too could become creatives one day uh, if they get insufficient uh, proximity to the creative class. So this is an odd form of class analysis uh, which really only celebrates one class and largely ignores or denigrates uh, the majority, the lumpen two-thirds of the population who apparently have little positive contribution uh, to make. 
Florida runs the numbers for the US census and finds ways of describing the growth of a creative class in rather spectacular terms, uh, especially since the 1970s. That's the blue line on the top here. Um, the super creative core is the green line. He has some indefensible way of measuring the number of bohemians. I don't think we, I don't, I don't think we check that on the census box, but uh, it's best not to look at how he calculates some of these things, but he claims that that also is rising. So there are more bohemians around, and they travel with the IT people and the urban hipsters and so on. That's the basic story. Now, the way that he makes this bite uh, is by endlessly producing rankings of cities, regions, and so on, according to the number of creative class people they've got, which is a, basically an indicator of their economic vitality and success. And, of course, we all like league tables, and we all like to see where we are in them. And this generates massive amounts of attention, both from local and national media, uh, and local and mayors and so on, want to see where they are, are they ahead of their peers, and, and so forth. Um, so Florida first did this for the United States. We've now got creative class rankings for Europe, uh, for Canada, of course, uh, for Aust Australasia. Um, it's been done around the world. Uh, there's also a global ranking that you can find on Florida's website now, which absurdly identifies Ottawa as the most uh, hipster place on the planet. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't ask me how he does this. But he constantly can rerun re these numbers constantly can change the, the rankings, and, and everybody pays attention. Uh, it's actually quite ingenious if you think about it. So what he's suggesting, of course, is if you've got lots of members of the creative class in your city, then all good things will follow from that. Um, one of many critiques of Florida that I want to uh, give you a, a glimpse of here uh, is from Frank Burris, a, uh, a writer in a cultural magazine from... Uh, uh, from uh, Minnesota, who, who makes the point about Florida's work. Florida was just describing the hipsterization of wealthy cities and concluding this was the, was the cause, what was, what was causing them to be wealthy. So the, the, one of the questions here is causality. Um, what, what causes the economic success of these places? Is it the creative class that bring it, or do they, are the creative class a, an, an after effect of economic growth? Burris is fairly convinced, uh, I, he agrees with me on this point, uh, that that's a little like saying that the high number of hot dog vendors in New York City is what's causing the presence of so many investment bankers. So if you want more banking, you just have to sell more hot dogs on the street. This simple correlations between the number of people in different groups and conclusions about causality are extremely uh, dubious, but this is the basis on which Florida's reasoning uh, is constructed. So the theory itself, um, I think I could summarize drawing on all of my scientific training as junk. Um, but it really doesn't matter that the theory is junk. Um, the, the arguments have got out into the world where they are producing effects um, irrespective of that. And, and the way in which that's occurred, as I think, is quite instructive. I think it speaks to the environment in which we currently live, that these arguments have been able to get traction and to spread. So if you look at uh, Florida's own prescription, especially his policy prescription, um, he argues that what city leaders need essentially are three T's, technology, uh, talent, and tolerance. Technology basically means a good set of universities, some high-tech companies. Um, talent is this mobile creative class who are the carriers of all good things. And tolerant, tolerance is what will bring the creative class to your city. Uh, which is what Florida variously calls plug-and-play communities or open people climates, places that are welcoming of newcomers, where people can arrive and establish a life quickly and so on. This is, his book is effectively a celebration of those sorts of open places that welcome um, high through flows of cosmopolitan uh, people. Now, if you're an urban leader uh, and you look at that list, uh, that first T, that's a pretty hard one to make much headway with that. The basic technology infrastructure is barely manageable by na national governments these days, let alone uh, local governments. Um, but what you can do uh, is manipulate your people climate to try to encourage the talented to arrive. 
And that's pretty much how the advice also follows. Cities have to make themselves attractive to the creative class, Florida argues, by offering the right lifestyle amenities with tolerant and open uh, people climates. Since now, according to his theory anyway, economic development follows uh, creative people. If you can get the hipsters to come to town, uh, then business opportunities will follow them, uh, not the other way uh, around. Now, so this has been translated into an urban policy template which is extremely uh, pervasive. Um, according to Alec McGillis, uh, who wrote a critique of this called The Ruse of the Creative Class, uh, there's a long tradition of charismatic economic development troubadours, but Florida has taken the art to a new level, wielding his creativity index and make, making each city feel that whatever its shortcomings, it has the potential to move up the ladder. So this is the use of these measures and indexes and so on to play on the insecurities of cities in a context of increased global competition and so on, and the anxieties of urban managers who need to formulate strategies in the face of those. So in Louisville, Florida held up the Louisville Slugger Museum as a potential creative class magnet. He lauded Columbia, South Carolina for its location in the midst of the Charlanta mega region. He told the residents of Sackville, New Brunswick, population 5,000, that they were in a cosmopolitan country town with obvious advantages over Toronto. So this message of Florida's can be sold in all of these different settings and many urban leaders in all of these kinds of places have found it extremely seductive and have developed policies in its um, uh, form. So you can go almost anywhere now and find a creativity strategy. It's in big cities um, like London, it's in small towns in the Polish countryside, it's in everywhere from Shanghai to Sheffield, uh, Tampa Bay to Green Bay, Wisconsin. You will find creativity strategies modeled according to the Florida uh, prescription. There's also a world of consulting products which is followed in the wake of this, some of them sold by Florida's own company itself, uh, but also there are many emulators who've entered uh, this field to sell creative products. Uh, one of them um, is the so-called Young and Restless Surveys. Here we have the conducted for Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the same one for Tampa Bay, Florida, for Providence, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Philadelphia apparently warranted a different cover. Uh, Portland uh, also had the same kind of treatment. And this is really about the repetition, a template strategy of the same kinds of measurements of what do the young and restless, the under 25s want from their city? How can we cater more to this group uh, in order to uh, build a strategy around the so-called creative class? One illustration of uh, what has been done at the state level is in the state of Michigan. Uh, here we have the former governor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm, announcing um, her cool cities strategy uh, directly lifted from Florida's playbook. Uh, their statement of this policy outlines the problem this way. Today's young professional workforce is more interested in working as a means of experience and enjoying life than their counterparts in the past. Is it? I, I don't know. Uh, apparently it is. Um, this group is increasingly mobile. Large numbers of talented workers have fled the state in search of employment. So Michigan clearly has a, a serious problem with its economy. In order to attract and retain them, cities have to change their paradigm of physical and social development. Michigan's Cool Cities program uh, has more than one of the more ludicrous public policy goals I've ever seen of making the state the coolest state uh, in the nation. You already know how this ends, so it, uh, it didn't exactly work. Um, but the, again, they borrow directly from the Florida uh, playbook in suggesting that given the right mix of services and amenities, the young and talented will vote with their feet and relocate to vibrant, walkable, mixed-use communities. Attracted by a talented, diverse workforce, business will follow. Um, so this is Florida's theory that you bring the hipsters back by providing um, relatively modest makeovers in gentrifying, happening communities. They were spending about $1,000 a time for bits of in public art, 
streetscape improvements, a bit of rehab and so on in, in funky districts of various towns uh, in Michigan. And we're supposed to believe that the young and restless of Michigan who look at the top quote, left the state looking for a job, will come back because there's a more a vibrant lifestyle to be had in Michigan and then wait for the job to come to them. Uh, there's no evidence that this um, would take place and in fact the program uh, predictably failed. Detroit uh, did the same kind of thing, also, to, also took advantage of Richard Florida's uh, advice directly. Um, on top of its other problems, uh, Detroit came 39th out of 49 cities on Florida's Creative Cities um, Index and invested um, several hundred thousand dollars in having income to town uh, to suggest what they should do about that position. Um, they launched an organization called Create Detroit, uh, which is presented as a grassroots effort uh, to, to grow the creative economy um, in Detroit. Its goal, Create Detroit, and there's no space between the two words, that makes it a bit more of a hipster word, apparently. Uh, create Detroit, uh, is, the goal is to make the city a destination city for the creative class. It mixes promotional events, uh, arts, which especially that mix arts and, uh, and economic development and business, and provides opportunities uh, for the creatives of Detroit to schmooze together um, over cocktails. Uh, it's mentioned this is a grassroots initiative, and these are the grassroots organizations uh, that set up Create Detroit. The Chamber of Commerce, the City of Detroit, the Governor's Office, Wayne State University, Detroit Economic Development Corporation, Detroit Renaissance, which is the businessman's uh, club there, Apple and SBC Corporation. Um, so this is apparently entirely consistent with the interests of those uh, orthodox economic development organizations. As one of the um, observers from the local media uh, pointed out when Florida uh, sold this plan to Detroit, Florida had the air of a motivational speaker, claiming that Detroit has more raw potential than any other city in the nation. He gave a brief synopsis of his concept of what makes a city a livable, vi vibrant place, but other than the obligatory white stripes and Eminem references, the speech could have been delivered in any ville. USA. Uh, and of course, that's where it had been delivered. It had been delivered hundreds, of, possibly now thousands of times, moderately adapted for each local setting. But there is a basic template from which uh, urban leaders can construct a strategy. Now, much of this occurred in the few years after the book came out, in the, which is now 10 years ago. But it continues, uh, and it has now gone on for, for quite some considerable time. So Florida was commissioned, for example, to write a strategy for the province of Ontario a couple of years ago. And uh, as Andrew Potter wrote in McLean's, the Ontario study bears the overwhelming greasiness of the creative class snake oil that Florida has been peddling for the past uh, few years. Um, this was a strategy for which he was paid $2.2 million uh, and was entirely predictable in terms of content. So this has passed deep into uh, conventional policy-making circuits in cities around the world. Uh, and really the question is, you know, how has it got such a hold? Where is the resistance to this? Where are the alternatives to it and so on? And here one of the interesting things, I think, is some of the stiffest uh, critiques of Florida have come from the creative communities uh, themselves. The Hamburg Squatters Movement, uh, for example, has issued a manifesto against Richard Florida called uh, Not In Our Name, a uh, manifesto against the jamming the gentrification machine, as they put it. Sorry, this is uh, slightly out of focus. Uh, they argue we don't want to position local neighborhoods as colorful, brash, eclectic parts of town uh, and to be effectively accessories for this uh, kind of conventional development. Uh, their, their manifesto starts with the words, a spectre has been stalking Europe since Richard Florida predicted that the future belongs to cities where the creative class feels at home. Uh, and the squatters and, and artist, artistic, art, arts activists of, uh, of Hamburg have produced this manifesto against this and reclaiming their right to the city, along with all residents of Hamburg who refuse just to become a loc location factor in some economic development uh, calculus. In, in Glasgow, in Scotland, uh, we have another arts group, Variant, 
who have uh, likewise pursued a strategy against this uh, creative um, uh, uh, takeover of, of, of policies in, the, in that country. An organization, Creative Scotland, they've critiqued, is being forged by bankers and businessmen who are evidently insensitive to or ignorant of the broad implications of cultural policy. Their interest is in this economically rationalist version of creativity as peddled uh, by Richard Florida. The poverty and consequent lack of autonomy of artists and cultural workers, variant argue, must be acknowledged as a key issue for any cultural organisation seeking to articulate the public interest and the common good. Unfortunately, Variant was later defunded by Creative Scotland, the organisation which it critiqued uh, on this, at this very moment. In uh, Berlin, uh, we have uh, an organization initi initiated by the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation, uh, which has been uh, campaigning for uh, the actual interests of creative industry workers, given that many people who work in the actually existing creative sector are in poorly paid, insecure, and precarious uh, positions. One thing you might reflect on, though, is if any of you have been to Berlin, you'll know that place is absolutely heaving with hipsters, uh, more per square kilometer than anywhere else I've ever been. Now, you'd think if Florida's theory was right, that the Berlin economy will be absolutely booming. Uh, in fact, it's one of the weaker urban economies in all of Europe. Uh, so clearly, it's not all you need is to just bring the creatives to town. There are plenty of creative people in Berlin. Many of the reasons they are there is for lower rents, which you will often find in an economy with a relatively weak base, uh, although gentrification in Berlin is now driving them out of that city. Closer to home, um, there's a marvelous uh, website established mainly by graduate students at the U of T uh, called Creative Class Struggle, uh, which has railed against uh, Florida, their local professor, and uh, stalks him at many public events. Uh, they argue in their mission statement that creative class policies are designed to build money-making cities rather than secure livelihoods for real people. Uh, these policies celebrate a society based on inequality in which a select group of glorified professionals is supported by an invisible army of low-wage service workers. Seduced by the promise of prosperity and growth, governments around the world are reorienting their economies along these lines without consulting immigrants, women, people of color, or low-wage workers. Divisive creative class policies serve only to increase the vulnerability of the vulnerable and to further empower uh, the powerful. One thing I can highly recommend uh, is the spoof twi Twitter feed, The Dick Florida, uh, which is somehow associated with the shady group from Toronto, uh, but which is an absolutely fantastic basically rolling spoof of uh, Florida-like statements, uh, many of which are hard to separate from the original, it has to be said. Uh, very well done. Um, the original, meanwhile, uh, continues uh, to present, him, present himself almost beyond parody. Here, here he is only two weeks ago in Nashville uh, with Jack White uh, after the White Stripes left uh, Florida, Flor uh, after they left Detroit, sorry, uh, Florida followed them to Nashville. Uh, so here he is with Jack White and the mayor of, uh, the mayor of Nashville celebrating their, the mayor's birthday. Uh, I gather they recorded a track together. Uh, I haven't heard that yet. Um, but you, you will find Florida promoting almost anywhere where there's a chance of... Uh, sort of selling this mixture of culture and economic uh, development, and Nashville is one of his uh, current favorite places. So let me wind up to a conclusion with some uh, comments that try to link uh, the front and the back of what I've just had to say. Um, what I want to suggest about the Richard Florida uh, phenomenon um, is that it's an extremely expedient uh, form, a framework for urban policy in this neoliberalized terrain uh, that I talked about at the, at the start. Creative city strategies are seamlessly compatible with a world uh, based on urban promotion efforts, on competitive styles of economic development, on widening social inequality, on urban bootstraps where we are all expected to pull ourselves up by our own uh, efforts and we should reward those that do, the talented, 
and the subsidisation of gentrification as a public policy goal. The creative class thesis fits perfectly, hand in glove, with these business as usual features of urban economic development policy. You might even say that it was designed for this environment uh, through which it's travelled at great speed. So what it provides then is a new urban policy uh, configuration. It enables a funky makeover of relatively conventional forms of urban economic development. It allows that group of uh, well-known actors in Detroit, for example, to present themselves as advocates of a creative, of a creative economy, to adorn their strategies uh, with, with local artists and rappers and so on, uh, while essentially still pursuing the same underlying goals. So it provides a way of freshening up a rather stale uh, urban economic development paradigm, which had really not been delivered, delivering the goods now for a generation. On the flip side, what creativity policies allow is they offer certain parts of the cultural policy community to claim an economic rationale. And given much of the cultural sector is chronically underfinanced, under um, I wouldn't blame anyone actually for taking advantage of this as a way of making a claim for improved funding for an art center or a museum or whatever it is. It, this is a seductive um, argument that seems to play with urban leaders and um, you know, many leaders of cultural organizations have decided to jump on the bandwagon and effectively present their version of culture as a, an economic development asset as well. What happens in the process is a new kind of creative growth coalition is formed, which includes the usual kinds of suspects from real estate and big business, but now would include selected members of the cultural communities um, that would join in these coalitions to, again, push particular kinds of projects for the city. What creative city strategies also do is effectively eventize urban development. They provide a rationale for high visibility, low cost, quick return interventions. No surprise these are appealing to mayors with, a, with terms of four or five years uh, ahead of them. Uh, they can go and open an art center and present this as part of their wider economic development strategy and so on. These quick returns, these investments are often relatively modest compared with the kinds of sums you would have to spend on real economic development strategies. This is small potatoes. So you can run a creative policy, policy strategy at relatively low cost um, and it fits with what cities are able to do in the present climate. In a nutshell, established urban interests have nothing to fear from the creative class. This is an enti entirely consistent with the current political economy of the neoliberal uh, city. Let me just, um, as I move to a conclusion, uh, make this point about the kind of argument which seems to gain traction in the uh, in this world at the present time, the kind of argument that Florida has presented. His book, as I mentioned, was a, is a sort of lifestyle guide for the would-be creative class, amongst other things, in which he celebrates various aspects of his own life, including uh, excruciating descriptions of his kitchen um, and the fancy equipment he's got in there, discussions of his hairdresser and her husband's job and all kinds of strange stuff. But one of the things he likes to celebrate is bicycling. And as somebody who also rides a bicycle, uh, this is one of the things that particularly gets under my skin, but I think actually speaks to the essence of Florida's approach here. Bicycling, he claims, is a de rigueur social skill for creatives, since to climb onto a bicycle and become the engine is a truly transformative experience, a creative experience. Uh, he says, he goes on to explain that creatives aren't particularly interested in team sports. Um, they prefer their own pumping thighs and to draw on their inner sources uh, when they are exercising. Uh, the creatives do, in fact, play alone. This is a celebration of a highly individualistic, self-absorbed, narcissistic uh, element of urban culture, which is presented as a paradigm for urban growth in, Flor in Florida's book. 
And the cultural critic Nick Lehman has written the most searing critique of this, which I think captures uh, the problems perfectly. The bicycle supplies an apt metaphor for the kind of commentary we get in an intellectual world that grows steadily more indifferent to questions of economic fairness and narrowing social opportunity. Its inhabitants find themselves speaking confidently on behalf of recombined new elites and entire economic orders. They are pleased to see their consumer choices ratified by history and their own taste preferences elevated as models for new networks of production and urban geographies. Their minds race and their hearts beat faster, but they ignore the ground speeding beneath their feet. So in conclusion, um, I want to suggest that the creativity fix uh, as this particular blend of economic development and culture associated with uh, Florida's arguments has traveled so far and fast, not because it's revolutionary, world-changing, as, as it's advertised by its author, uh, but because it's minimally disruptive of the established patterns of neoliberal urbanism. It's constructed for this environment, it's traveled across this landscape, it's uh, it insinuated itself into urban policy uh, networks and so on, um, rather predictably, I would argue, uh, but also quite stubbornly and doggedly. So it's not been seriously displaced by something else, uh, at least not so far. What the creativity uh, script does is it effectively provides a script and hails urban actors for this kind of funky makeover of what is business as usual urbanism, of conventional forms of competitive economic development adorned uh, with uh, creative um, decoration. So the creative city paradigm then appropriates the arts and culture as accoutrements for this entrepreneurial uh, project. It's interesting though that the most, as I mentioned, the most serious resistance in many ways to the, uh, this appropriation has come from arts and cultural activists uh, themselves in cities like Berlin, Amsterdam, Glasgow and so forth, which have become, which are actually underlining the fact that the arts and culture community itself is a place of contestation and a place where these claims on the city can be uh, rebutted and alternatives uh, presented. And so the arts sector has offered up protest and critique uh, rather than co-optation and conformity with uh, Florida's uh, and Florida-style forms of development. It embraces, of course, much more expansive uh, imaginaries than the kind of instrumental economic rationality that's associated with the creative class, where the arts really um, are really only there to lubricate conventional forms of economic development. This isn't about expanding our imaginary and our imagination. It's about focusing in on very narrow forms of economic instrumentalism. And the arts, of course, provide uh, opportunities for the reclaiming of public spaces versus the kind of privatized spaces that we see um, in the conventional uh, forms of creative city uh, policy. So the arts then have been a site of resistance, um, a fairly consistent resistance to the Richard Florida Creative Cities project, but it remains out there. Um, it still finds adherence. Uh, it still uh, travels the world uh, even a decade or so after its, uh, after its launch. I'll stop there and uh, I'll look forward to our uh, conversation. Thank you.